Uh, again, this morning, we're going to go through the 2000. I know it's been around for a while, um, uh, but just to give you a refresher on it a little bit. And then also, um, um, the 95 is run a lot the same way. Uh, so if you do have questions on either the 2000 or the 95, uh, you know, feel free to kick in and um, um, we'll try to answer everything we can. So, okay, well, here we go, guys. Uh, again, this is the 2000. Uh, it's for the large, slow-speed engines. Um, this is the wiring um, diagram uh, for them. Um, as you can see up here in the corner, um, if you have a four-cycle engine, you know you'll uh, you'll have to run the Hall effect on the camshaft, and we'll talk about that more uh, uh, in the coming slides. Uh, the logic module is where we get all of our information from. Um, and then, uh, whoops, it's all powered with uh, 24 volts, and we recommend like a 10 amp power supply on that. Uh, if we're running multi-strike, uh, you can pull up to up to maybe six to eight amps, uh, depending on how large the engine is. If you're running, like for an example, a Z, where you're running 32 coils or so. So, um, and then we have the output module. We have two of those, two different types. We have a 16 output and a 32 output depending on the size of the engine. Uh, the 32, of course, will have two cables coming out the side of it. Um, and we'll get into that more too. And then we've also added here a number of years ago, the diagnostic module that looks at the secondary, uh, excuse me, the primary wiring. Um, and then we can um, give you a um, reference number on how much kind of demand you have on the system or on your spark plugs and stuff. And uh, we have different uh, set point levels to give you alarms and shutdowns from that. So, uh, the layout on it here, uh, uh, to program it, uh, we, we use a PLC or a laptop or um, and with an RS-45 uh, connection in the logic module. Uh, and that also can be brought out into a PLC if you want to monitor the register numbers also. Again, we require 24 volts uh, to power it. And if you want to change the timing from either a PLC or a remote source, uh, uh, it's capable of the 4 to 20 uh, input from an outside source to control the timing. Uh, that's needed for a lot of the low, uh, the low speeds, um, large engines that require um, to advance the, the ignition way past top dead center uh, to give a boost to the turbochargers. Um, so we can either do that with an RPM mapping or uh, most likely they use uh, air manifold pressure uh, from an outside source. So uh, it's gear teeth uh, references with the pickups uh, to keep the ignition real accurate uh, within, I believe, uh, within a half a degree. Um, and then it requires a reset pin that resets at every revolution. And again, if you were running a um, four cycle engine, you would run a Hall effect. So it only fire on the compression stroke. So uh, the output module, again, we have the 32 and the 16 output modules. Um, that was is where all the high power is generated to uh, arc to coils. And then with the option of adding a um, the diagnostic module that will just plug in in between the logic and the output module, where we can get all the primary uh, data back to the logic module for troubleshooting. So. Uh, again, if you do hook that up, it's uh, not needed. Uh, if you do think you have a problem with that, need to ship it in for um, repair, you can just jumper the wire from the logic module back directly to the output module and then go into the uh, keypad. And then you can turn off that portion of the program and you'll be able to operate the engine until you have uh, the diagnostic re repaired for any reasons. So. This is layout on a Cooper, uh, GMV, A possibly. Um, and as you can see here, this is the junction box um, where all the primary wires will come in from the coils. Up on top of that is the diagnostic box. And then you can see this little cable running in here. This is where we get the information off the primary wiring off the N and V lead here. And then this is our, uh, this would be a, a 16 output um, output module because you can see there's only one cable coming off the side on it. We do require all those boxes to be grounded to the engine 
and then to earth ground. And you, as you can see, with these grounding wires up in here, it's grounded up in here on this lug, and then it's grounded underneath here, here. So that's very important to make this thing operate correctly. And the logic module, this is what we're going to talk about first. Uh, we do make two different types. Um, the, uh, the S type, it was designed um, to take the test mode out of the system. Uh, and the reason for that is we do have some customers that does not uh, use that portion of it there for safety reasons on their end. Uh, they, they ran into an issue with firing it without purging the engine correctly and it, it caused a backfire. So, so keep that in mind. We're going to talk about that a little bit more here in the coming slides. But if you do use the test mode, you've got to make sure, you've got to be 150% sure that uh, or 200% sure there's no fuel in the system because this will fire the plugs at I believe around 60 RPM and it really doesn't know where the pistons are. So if you have a ported engine and you got the intake and exhaust both open and, um, and the plug fires there, that will definitely cause a backfire. So, so be real careful. So that's the reason uh, we did come out with the S version to uh, uh, for the people that aren't um, aren't sure how that works so we get all of our information from there um, everything comes up on the screen let you know if it's running good our diagnostic messages our timing uh, control and then this is where also where we set it up we do not program it from here that has, has to be done from a laptop um, but all the other changes uh, can be made from the touch screen Uh, we have the power light up on top, letting you know it's powered, and then we have our alarm if, to let you know there's any kind of alarm. And then, of course, the display here will come up with um, uh, how the engine's performing um, and any kind of diagnostics we'll read from there. So, there are, It is fused. It's got two 3-amp uh, automotive-type fuses, the ones that plug in on top. Um, you can get those from any kind of parts store. Uh, again, these are three amp fuses because all this, um, the computer boards and everything like that is very low voltage in there. I mean, we run 12 volts into it, but it, it doesn't uh, take a lot of amperage to power that. So. Uh, and we also have some um, EPROMs and micro, or microprocessors uh, chips in there too. When we have made changes in the past, uh, we've updated these uh, processor chips. Um, uh, with new data on it that hasn't been done in, in quite some time but it's it, the, but that's what the, the purpose is and then underneath the little box here and these are all covered up too with a cover out you don't see them until you remove either the the face cover here or this cover underneath the wiring here so but this little cover here if you were going to uh, <clears throat> replace that <clears throat> excuse me the EEPROM chip uh, it's underneath this cover and, and then also if you were going to um, replace that logic module itself and you didn't have the capability of programming that you could pull the chip out of the older system and plug it into the new one and it, it retains all of the programming in it so, um, so that makes it a little easier for you this is the laid out if you open up the door uh, we have a cable that runs from the either from the diagnostic module or from the output module that will come in here and then plug into all these different components uh, to make the system works. And one thing to remember here, you'll find a brown wire and a pink wire um, that doesn't look like it's got any place to go, and they'll end up on these two um, serial communication ports here, so keep that in mind. So uh, To program it uh, with your laptop, you'll need to have a serial port um, uh, computer, but we've I've, I've got some good news to talk about that here coming slides to hook up to um, the terminals on the left hand side um, to, for programming purposes um, and then to shut the engine down we have a 5 volt switch here that you can ground that and that will shut not power down the ignition but it will shut the ignition off it also has alarms and shutdown features that you can bring in uh, to a PLC to give you a warning on it and the neat feature to this system also is a fire confirmed. Um, what it will do is, if you have your fuel valve tied to this, 
the 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 system has to be firing before the fire confirm will uh, will switch. So it's a good safety feature if you do start up an engine and for whatever reason the ignition did not fire, uh, it won't allow you to turn the fuel valve on if it's tied to that. So it's um, it it's a great feature for for stopping backfires and stuff. So. And then we have the current loop over here. This is the timing control from an outside source, um, either from a PLC or a, possibly a gauge or some sort can do that. So um, all the pickups are also brought into here for the reset pin, the hall effect for the four cycle, and then the gear teeth uh, off the flywheel, gear teeth or uh, ring gear. Um, and then, of course, the 24 volts come in over on, on this side here, so for the power. Would Mike. You recommend? Yes. Mike, one thing to mention here, it's happened many times, and probably a lot of people on the phone know about it, but there, there there's these 17 small wires that uh, we, we pick up and, and have to wire, and, and commonly the pink and the red get mixed up, and the tan and the brown get mixed up, and this just happened last week again. So... Uh, just as a reminder, those four wires commonly get miswired because they're semi-close in color. So just just to, just wanted to mention that. Yeah. So keep keep a keep a guy let's not, not color blind maybe to do that for you. Um, myself, I have to I I struggle with my old age now and and my my eyesight anymore. So yes, that's a good very good point um, to make sure you've got the right colors in the right spot uh, before you power this up. So. Hey, Paul, what, what were the symptoms that you saw? Well, this one was a, a, a Ingersoll 12 cylinder and uh, it was missing primaries on six of the cylinders. Now they were actually firing, but the diagnostic because the, the, the pink and the red were mixed up. Oh no, it was the brown and the tan, I believe. Anyways, it, it gave six primaries uh, were, were faulted. So that was the, uh, the air with the miswire. But the engine actually fired correctly? Yeah, it was actually, yeah, it, it actually fired right. Okay. Well, good to know. Uh, the output module. Again, we have two of those. Uh, this is a 16 output. Of course, it's up to 16 uh, cylinders or 16 outputs. So if you're running, um, you can either tire the coils together and put 16 on them, or if you were uh, wanted to separate the primary wire on the coil, you could do up to eight engine or eight cylinders on it. So. Uh, again, you can see the nice ground they have here on the box, and then they also ran an extra ground here, uh, probably either into the panel or uh, somewhere on the engine block again on that. Um, so a real good setup here. Inside the cover, if you get inside there and pull off a couple areas in there, we do have two 10-amp uh, fuses in there. Um, we also recommend when you wire this to wire uh, some inline fuses to help protect that because you'd prefer to have the outside fuses blow before you got into here but because it's um, a little harder to get to these but um, you have to disassemble it partly but but if you lights if you open up the door and there's no red lights in there blinking off and on or like that there's a good possibility that you might have either lost power going to this or you may have blown some fuses on it so uh, to wire it, if you were going to wire uh, with the uh, coils um, tied together, um, you would um, one wire per coil on this. Um, uh, or if you were running two coils on, on the same cylinder, then you would tie one primary to both coils. And if we're running diagnostic uh, module, we normally don't recommend that because now you're sharing that information of the two coils with one wire. So it makes the diagnostics a little harder to read. So um, we would recommend doing it this way, where you would separate the wiring and then uh, have a one primary wire per coil. Uh, it gives you a much better uh, diagnostics and then a lot more energy will go to the coil because they both are on the same capacity or uh, two different capacitors at that point. So our 32 output. Again, you can tell the difference real quick because it has two uh, output connections on it. Also has the same fuses on the inside on it. Um, so if we do run into problems with that, you know, that's one thing you might want to check. The wiring in that also, um, 
if you wanted to tie the coils together, um, um, you would uh, pick up a, a wire, um, like A would fire one coil, and then two, uh, A2 would be the other harness, would fire the other one. But again, if we're running diagnostics um, and to take the full advantage of having the two outputs, we would separate those. So one cylinder would have uh, two wires run into it for each coil, and they would actually come from this two different harnesses also in the out, uh, in the uh, junction box. So, um, but I highly recommended if you're going to uh, do that. And also with that one there, uh, you got to make sure that you use the right firing code. Uh, normally, if you've got a oops, if you have a two cycle engine, you would use two in the firing code down here. If I can get it with my mouse. No, nope, don't like that for whatever reason. There we go. So this one here shows a six, if you can see that. And normally, if it was a two cycle, it would be um, a two. And if it was a four cycle, it would be a four. But if we're going to separate these like this, uh, you have to reprogram it to put a six in there for a two cycle and an eight in there for a four cycle. So, so keep that in mind uh, if you do decide to rewire one. So. And then we also have a, uh, a another box for special applications. As you can see down here, if you get one that has uh, the note says number three, uh, they're a real close firing uh, pattern on that. So we, we, we build a special box, the dash two for that uh, setup. Um, and to do that also, you'll have to use the memory code of six and eight uh, to make that work. So. Um, we have run across a couple of cases where they've misread the application list and uh, ran into a, a problem with that. So, uh, so anyways, keep that in mind. Um, if, uh, make sure when you are looking at the application, if it has a note three in there to uh, make sure you use the right box on that if you're using a 32 output. Secondary diagnostics. Um, um, again, that's something we've added here a few years back, um, and that reads the primary, uh, the load on the primary wiring and gives you a uh, reference number uh, out on that. So um, it's got three cables coming in. Basically, this is cables goes in and out on it. These are the primary cables coming in from the uh, logic module, and then the other one feeds out into the um, the output module. So. Uh, I don't believe uh, these cables, it makes any difference in how they're connected. I believe if they're connected either way, that will work. Um, and then here, like I mentioned earlier, this we've got, this is a, a harness that's got three wires in it, uh, but we use just the A and B wire, and we bring that um, in from the output module, from the N and V lead, so. This also has uh, three six, 0.3 amp fuses in it. And these are not a common fuse that you can buy from a parts store. Um, I'm not sure if you can buy them from any place but us uh, or through the distributors. Uh, it's a square type fuse, a uh, little red fuse. Um, so keep that on hand uh, because, I, again, you're not going to go down to a regular parts store and buy those. So um, if you do run into problems with that. So. And this would be inside the junction box if you were going to uh, wire the, the diagnostic module. You'll have to get in there and get hooked to your N and V lead on cable number one on that. And I believe, Kenneth, don't you, didn't you say you tied both of yours together on yours cables in case they got swapped or not? Yeah, if you look at the N and V on the set on connector two, they are not, they are open-ended at the connector in the output module, so. Right, okay. But in that case, if they're open uh, and the cables got backwards, do you still get that reading of open primary then? Uh, no, that's that's what I'm saying. If you, you can connect the wires together in the junction box, because on connector two, they are not connected anywhere in the okay, output. Gotcha. Okay. So if you do run into a problem where you've disconnected on a 32 output, where you've disconnected the output uh, cables and crossed them, uh, in some cases, if you put that on there, you're going to read open primary on all your primary on it. Um, 
because it's looking at cable number one, but if you tie them together internally uh, in the junction box, that will eliminate that. So, um, but so that's something you want to make sure that um, it's set up right. So let me go back to that. Yeah, with these two cables outputs here, we've got to make sure that you don't jump the wires back and forth on that when you pull them off for whatever re reason. In some cases, if the timing is set up to fire the second coil at a so many degrees difference, if you swap those, that will also swap the timing on it too. So, so just for safety reasons, yeah. make sure that so, they're marked and go back on the same way. Those, those app applications that are specific, Mike, we don't tie them together. Okay, gotcha. And here's a laid out on, on an engine again. Um, the output's up here, it's a 16, it's only got one cable coming out. And this is the diagnostics here. And the nice way this is set up is, if the diagnostic did have a problem for whatever reason, you could disconnect this cable here and run it directly to the output module and get the engine back up and running again. So. Um, so if you are setting these up, try to keep these somewhat close to each other uh, in case you do run into a problem with, uh, from lightning hit or something on that line where you, you do have a problem with the diagnostics. I mean, not that I hardly ever see that, but uh, this way you can easily jump a cable across, go into your logic module, turn that part of the program off, and be able to operate the engines. Uh, the pickups, we talked about this earlier on some of our other sessions in there. I just wanted to throw that in there real quick. But um, the gap for the reset and for the um, gear teeth, or in this case, they have holes here. Um, it's around 15,000 plus or minus five. Um, in most cases, if you screw the pickup in where it touches the flywheel, you can back it out a quarter of a turn, and that will get you pretty close to that. Just remember when you do the reset pin, that there is a bolt out there somewhere on the flywheel. So make sure you line your pickup up with the reset bolt uh, before you set that. Otherwise, it will snap off the end of the pickup. So On the pickups, Mike, like I said earlier, go ahead. Mike, I want to mention on the, on the newest mag pickup, the 691-118, the resistance uh, that we, we, we've been sending out for the last six months or so is, is 1500 plus or minus 75 so it's higher than the old ones just just to be aware of it okay we're going to get to that here shortly so um uh, again the pickups uh tie right into the logic module um i think the cables come up to am i 50 feet is that correct or are they longer than that i believe they're on 50 feet they're 100 feet you can get 100 okay um so wait Myself, I do not like splicing these anywhere. They come with a shielded wire in it. So I would like, I mean, I recommend that you run a complete pickup without any splices in it and then ground the shielding on the inside of the box. That keeps some of the noises out of them. And also don't recommend running it any next to any of this high voltage stuff over here where it might be able to pick up another pulse and give you an improper uh, timing and stuff or improper uh, pulses coming in on it. So. Uh, the reset pin here, um, as you can see, it sticks up from the flywheel. Uh, we give you a little drawing here. It's made out of a quarter-inch bolt. Uh, I made a little note down here. Make sure it's not stainless steel. I mean, since I've been involved with Ultronic, whoops, uh, I've run across uh, probably at least three of them. Jobs we've been on where this has been replaced, and they have a habit of, gr of pulling the shiniest bolt out of the tool uh, box and uh, nine times all 10 is stainless steel and they grind it, put it on, and then we miss the reset pin on it. So, so make sure it's a regular um, uh, carbon steel bolt because um, it needs to be able to see that, uh, uh, so the pickup can actually see that, so. Hey, Mike. Yes. Um, I know it's kind of difficult to do, but just in case on, you mentioned earlier on the, the drain wire, Make sure you only ground that on one end. You said in the box, which is good, um, but just to reiterate that if you ground it on both ends, you've just created an antenna. So make sure you only ground it on one end um, and leave the other side cut and uh, taped up or in the harness or whatever. So. And I believe our harnesses are only, uh, the part that has the cannon plug on it, there is no, it's not connected. 
anywhere on the Canon blog, I don't believe, correct? That's generally correct, yep. Yes, okay. And that may be something you might want to check with a voltmeter if you are running some wires like that to make sure you don't have continuity coming out from your shielded wire all the way to the other end. Uh, make sure it's open on one end, so good point. Yeah, most likely on our sales drawings, you'll see it. Um, if there is a shield wire attached, you'll see like a dashed line showing that it's attached to the shell. But um, on, on our pickups, that's that's not the case. It's not grounded. Okay, thanks, Matt. Uh, the pickups here, and Paul just mentioned that. Uh, for a long, long time, I've been running around 1,100 ohms, and this one here shows 900 ohms uh, from this drawing. But with our newer pickups we've had out now for probably the last six months, maybe, four to six months, uh, Paul just mentioned he has checked those, and they're up to 1,500 ohms now. So the so biggest thing you want to check on those is just to make sure, for one, you've got continuity, continuity through the pickup, through the both pins, and that you don't have any continuity from a pin to the casing of the pickup on it. So... Um, to, uh, to make sure the pickup is good. So, the Hall effect for anybody with a four cycle engine, uh, you'll need a Hall effect. The purpose of that is so we do not what we call wasted spark where we fire on the exhaust stroke. Um, this uh, eliminates that from happening. Uh, on a compression so stroke, the Hall effect and the reset pin will line up exactly at the same time, letting you know that it's okay to fire. And then when it when it comes up another revolution, the reset pin's gonna come there, come up, show up on the flywheel, but the Hall effects is gonna be um, 180 degrees off. So uh, it will say, okay, uh, not don't fire on this revolution. So, uh, so that's the purpose of that. That has a switch internally on it. I think I got another, yeah. So what that is, it's, uh, it looks at a magnet that crosses over there and to make sure the magnet has got the North Pole single set up on it. Because if you put it just a regular magnet, uh, with a reverse polarity on it, it won't work. So, um, so keep that in mind. And then the internally, um, there's, it, it's got a switching mechanism in it there that will turn off and on, um, uh, and it will send five volts back to the um, logic module to uh, either tell it's working or, or um, tell it to fire or not to fire on it. So, uh, you can test these with a nine volt battery and a voltmeter. Uh, if you get into some of our um, literature there, it will show you how to do that. So basically you can, can power up uh, a couple of the switches and then read the other one and you can run a magnet underneath the pickup and you can see the thing turn on and off. So, And I believe some of our distributors actually sell one that has a little light on it. Is that correct, Kenneth? Where you can actually, it actually turns the light on and off to test those? Yes, we have a tester like that. Okay. Uh, these are the different type of pickups, uh, excuse me, magnets we have. Um, again, these are a metric thread, um, uh, an a, a M8 thread on it. So, and I think all of them are the same threading on it. We have uh, this particular one here, and then we have just like it, but it has a hex on it. Makes it a little easier to tighten down. And then we've had, we've got this other one that's fairly small. It's for uh, getting into a, uh, a really tight location, and you'll see that uh, on our coming uh, uh, presentation when we're doing a uh, that 95 EBS on a cap. They have one of those mounted in on the uh, camshaft, so uh, give you an idea what it looks like installed. So uh, the coils on it, um, you can set the coils up so you have one primary. We'll fire two coils, um, and that's will work. But if you were trying to run diagnostics, um, it makes it hard for the diagnostic box to tell uh, what coil is good or bad. It will, it will give you a, a reading back if one does go bad, but it makes it hard to determine what coil it is. So um, on, our, um, on our XL system, we actually have one primary wire, but we are able to read the coil information coming back on it, uh, the way the electronics is set up on it. But for the 2000 and the 95s, it, uh, for the diagnostic, it makes it a little harder So, uh, on one primary. And it also, we're sharing one capacitor with two coils, so the output to the coils is not as high either as it would be if it was uh, separate. So, so this is normally we would recommend 
uh, how to set them up if you're capable of doing that. In some cases, if you're running a, a GMVH with a flat crank in it, where you're firing four coils at the same time because it's firing cylinders one and six and two and five and three and four, so you're not able to do this. So, uh, But in most cases, uh, you can separate them like this. So. The home screen. This is what it should look like if the engine's not running. It should not say run on it. Um, in some cases it does because of the way they're set up, but 99% of the time normally it will say shut down. If, the, if that little uh, number eight lug, or is it eight, I think it is, is grounded. Um, um, and the idea behind that is we wanna roll the engine over a few times to, to purge it, to get all the gas out of the system all the cylinders and all the exhaust manifold and um, intake manifold. And, and so when we do turn the ignition on it, we're, we're, we're just firing air at this point. Um, if it does say run, it's only gonna make a couple revolutions. And as soon as it syncs up with the reset and the gear teeth, it's gonna start firing the, the ignition. So if there's any fuel in the system, it could cause a backfire. So, um, so try to make sure it is in the shutdown mode before um, you start rolling the engine over so and then as soon as we on ground that lead it's going to say ready and then it's going to start sinking it will make a couple revolutions and then we'll go to firing and it all happens about that quick or actually faster than that and then i just said so sometimes that you got to be really looking at to be able to see that so uh so ideal when it's running uh in this case here uh it says it's firing we're in energy level one uh, the S stands for single striking. The engine's running at 300 RPM. In this case, we're giving a 15 milliamp uh, single to it, and we're controlling the timing at 10 degrees before top bid center. That's all the information it gives you on a normal uh, operating engine. Now, if it shows a stall on it, that's telling you the ignition was doing its job, but for some reason we didn't get a fuel uh, input on it or something else caused the engine to come to a stop that the engine itself or the ignition itself was doing everything it can to fire uh, one thing to note on that though as soon as we ground that uh, shutdown lead that this will go away it will go into a shutdown mode again so so it's something you got to be watching right in front to see this um, but it's a good troubleshooting tool letting you know where to go look for a problem Okay, from a normal um, shutdown, this is what it should look like. If we have one that says View Diagnostics, um, you'll hit the Diagnostic button, button, and then it will tell you what the uh, what the first output was on it would actually shut it down. But what you also want to do is maybe hit the Next button on it, making sure there's not multiple diagnostic problems in it. So, um, and then to clear the, all this, you'll have to hit the Reset button to um, uh, to clear, clear the alarms on it, so, or shutdowns. Uh, the first one's warning. Warnings are telling you there's something going on with the ignition, but it's not bad enough to shut the ignition off, we feel. So um, it could be an open primary, a shorter primary. Um, if you run in the diagnostic uh, module, it could be a low voltage or a high voltage or a, a no voltage. Um, there's a multiple things that uh, could happen on individual cylinders uh, but again, we normally try to keep the engine running there. Uh, we're just letting you know if there's a problem that needs to be addressed as soon as possible. Uh, and these are some of the other ones on it. Uh, low output voltage. Uh, on A side, that's telling you that A capacitor, for some reason, didn't get a full charge. Um, and it gives you an alarm on that. Sometimes you run into, we got a bad board on the, on the logic module that will also tell us this also. So it may not be an output module. It could be a um, something got fried in the board on it. So uh, then primary fault, and this is telling you A and S is faulted. So you'll have to figure out what the firing uh, order is to find out what cylinders these are. Um, current loop out of range. Uh, that could be two things. One, you could have lost the four to twenty uh, coming in uh, to the logic module. Or you may not even be using that, and that part of the program is turned on. So you can get into the uh, timing switch on that, or the button on that, and uh, if you're not using the 4 to 20, and turn that part of the program off. So 
and then the EEPROM memory checksum failed, that's telling you that the EEPROM has lost its memory um, in the chip and either it needs to be replaced or reprogrammed. So, um, And then I get to kick out the display board not running because if the display board wasn't running, you wouldn't see the display. But anyways, if there are if there is a problem with the display board, it also has an alarm for that. And then the bottom one down there where the diagnostic module not detected, um, that's telling you that it's lost communication to the um, to the diagnostic module, and that could because the logic module could be bad. It could have blown a fuse. It may not even be there because uh, if the logic module is turned turned that part of the program on, it's going to read that that it's looking for it, but it's not really there. So in that case, you can just go into the keypad and the program and turn that part of the program off. So um, also you'll see that too if the wiring coming in that pink and brown wiring come in into the logic module, if they get disconnected, that also may be another reason that that's not uh, showing up there. So, uh, and the 4 to 20 um, out of range, uh, part of it there, that will trigger, whoops, that will trigger if it gets less than 2 milliamps on the low end, and if it goes over 22 milliamps on the high end, is when that alarm will come in on that. So, so keep that in mind. Uh, we also give you a, a little worksheet there if you are wiring one of these, uh, depending on how far the um, equipment is away from the power supply, we give you recommendations here on um, what wiring size to use. Um, the, the smallest being uh, a 16 gauge wire at up to 25 feet. Um, a lot of our distributors run possibly um, uh, a 12 gauge to power a lot of this stuff just for safety reasons uh, to make sure there's enough power there. And then over here on this side here, if you do want to know what the amp draw is going to be on that, um, you got a little formula here that you can put in how many cylinders you're firing. And that's so much cylinder, how many coils you're firing. So if it's a 10 cylinder engine with two coils, you got to put 20 in there. Then if the engine's running around 330 RPM, you put that in there, and then you can either multiply it by uh, 8,000 or 4,000. Uh, that will give you an amp read on it. And if you do do that, you'll probably find out that it's a really low amp draw on it, but we're still telling you to run 10 amp power supplies. And the a reason behind that, one, if you run a multi-strike, it draws a lot more. And two, when you first fire the ignition up to charge the capacitors, there's a hard, high draw to, uh, to charge the capacitors on it. So we want to make sure there's plenty out there to protect that. So again, this is uh, in your installation sheet, uh, this information is. Now fault, if you do have a fault on it, the engine's going to shut down um, uh, for safety reasons to make sure that the engine, if it gets out of time uh, or sync with its pickups or anything like that, uh, it, it's not safe to run, so we're going to shut it down. So. Again, uh, some of the uh, reasons it would go down, your gear teeth is missing, uh, the hall effect is missing, maybe it went down on overspeed. Normally we recommend the overspeed on that to be higher than the panel because when this over, when we trick this overspeed, it's gonna shut the ignition off. So normally your panel's gonna see no RPM and the, it's gonna tell the governor to throw more fuel at it. So ideally we would want you to turn the engine off by shutting the fuel off first. Uh, so we let the panel do that. So we'll have an overspeed on the panel um, of where the engine rec uh, uh, manufacturer recommends to put the uh, overspeed at. And normally we might put this maybe 10 or 20 RPM higher than that. So, so if we didn't catch it on the uh, panel, then we also have a secondary backup to get the engine shut down. So uh, the other one up there is of course the reset faults if it's missing. Uh, gear teeth, we may be counting not enough or count too many. Uh, I believe we give you around three either direction. Uh, so if you bust off any gear teeth uh, from maybe a starter uh, hanging up or something, um, we're going to sense that and, and be able to shut it down. And then, of course, the bottom one at the backboard in the logic module fails. Uh, it loses the um, information and it also will shut you down. So. Adjust the timing on the engine um, to do the global timing. 
Uh, from the home screen, we would hit the timing button. Um, well, from the home, I'm just a little jumping myself. Uh, hit the timing button, and then it's going to go to global engine. So you'll hit the up arrow key on the display. And you want to adjust retard, so you hit the up arrow key again. And this would be where you adjust the timing on it. The top one is the retard, so this is the maximum retard that you can go. In this case here, it was 10.5. And then the timing on the engine at the flywheel is 12, uh, point, uh, 12 degrees before top dead center. So uh, Now, this was reading, if the retard up here was reading zero, and you wanted to adjust the timing to, say, 14 degrees, you can't go any further than that because the maximum retard is already maxed out here. So you got to make sure when you set the engine up and place your reset pin in your hull effect, if it's a four cycle, you got to make sure they're far enough out. And in the manual, it recommends six degrees, but a lot of our distributors put it out there 10 degrees to give you a little bit of a, a cushion in there. Um, so keep that in mind. If you can't push the timing any further and you want to, you'll have to go in and reset the uh, reset pin and possibly the hull effect to make that work. So. Also on the timing button, hit the up arrow key to get you the global. Now, if you wanted to turn off the current loop on and off, well, I think I've got too many keys here. Okay. The computer locked up for a second. So you go to global engine, and then you hit the select mode. So that would be the down arrow key. And then the first one comes up as current loop. And now this is where you would turn that uh, 420 on and off. So one... Well, you, so you don't get that al alarm coming up on the display or for if, if you're not using the 4 to 20 or for whatever reason you may have a problem with the 4 to 20 in the panel or something this gives you an idea where you can actually shut it off until the problem's corrected so the next one up from there would be uh, or down from there would be the engine um, uh, R RPM map uh, so this way we can actually put a program in using the laptop and we can actually build a uh, RPM uh, ignition curve on it. So if you were starting the engine up and you wanted the engine, to, uh, the timing to fire more to top dead center, maybe to help light the fuel off a little bit or possibly give you some more energy into the exhaust, you could, you could set the ignition up to fire maybe uh, 10 degrees after top dead center at a low RPM. Then as the RPM started ramping up, then you could uh, push the timing back to uh, before top dead center and get it up to, up to uh, wherever the normal timing would be, 10 degrees or so. So, And you can do all that just by looking at the RPM on it. And this is where you would not program it at because you'd have to do that with a laptop, but this is where you can turn that part of the program on and off uh, from your keypad. Uh, uh, this is where if you're talking to the um, ignition from... Um, the reference, or excuse me, from the reference, not even reference number, I'm lost here for a second. Um, the serial communication going back and forth, you can pull this information off and, and bring it into a PLC, and this will give you um, where you can control the timing on it. Um, and this is where, if you're not going to be using that, most people just use the 4 to 20. This is where you would turn that part of that program on and off also. Now, the one-step timing on it. Um, again, this is something you need to program at the beginning uh, with a laptop to turn that off and on, but this is where you can go in and make adjustments uh, on that. And we're going to talk about that a little more here later. It doesn't get utilized a lot, um, but it allows you to, uh, if you're changing fuel, like high BTU fuel to low BTU fuel, and you want to have a way of changing the timing without uh, automatically, like without going in and uh, doing it with a keypad, this allows you to do that. And I say we're going to talk about that a little more here later. So, um, but anyway, this makes it adjustable with your keypad without getting into the laptop again. And you can see here, they, um, this is where it's turned off and this is where it's turned on. So uh, these are some different things that could go in there and do that. Um, if you're looking at, uh, ex say, the air manifold temperature, and it got to a, uh, it was getting really high. You didn't want the engine to detonate. You could trigger this gauge here, and you could you, you could ground out that one step um, 
uh, timing control, and you could back the timing off to keep it out of detonation. Or possibly with a uh, one of our uh, annunciators or a PLC of some sort, um, you could look at um, exhaust, or excuse me, um, air manifold temperature also, and then turn a switch on and off to control that. So. This way, if you get that, it's not. It's, if it's not present, that means it hasn't been programmed into it. So, and then this is where it, this is where it comes up. The switch comes up at. Um, there's multiple things you can do with that. It depends on how you set the program up, and we'll get into that when when we get into the program part. But I made just made some little notes here. You can do the timing with, like I mentioned, or if you program it, if you wanted to go to maximum energy level, like maybe energy level three. Uh, let's just say the engine's running. Um, Maybe lightly loaded, or uh, maybe, uh, or maybe a heavy load, and you get a little misfire on it. You could actually tell your PLC to put the ignition in this condition on max uh, energy going out to fire the plugs, and it's basically you ground this switch out um, to do that. And then even maybe even multi-strike. Say you're running at maybe a 50 or 60 percent torque on the engine, and the engine's misfiring a little bit. You could trigger your uh, your panel. To, to ground this switch out, and then you could automatically turn the multi-strike on to maybe make the engine run uh, better. Or in the case on number four here, if you were running pre-chambers, and you're running a one pre-chamber and an open chamber, you got the engine up and running, it's running really lean, that uh, the second plug's not doing anything because it's so lean, you're relying on the pre-chamber, well, you can go in there and tell the PLC to, tell, to turn that off if you want to. Um, and then when they slows the engine back down again at a certain RPM, maybe you want to turn it back on. Um, it does that automatically if you program it at 200 RPM. But if you want to have more control over it with uh, with your panel, we give you that option and part of the setup. So, uh, the offset uh, from individual timing control uh, from the uh, from the home screen, you hit the timing button. You see the cylinder individual, you use a down arrow key, then you want to adjust the offsets. Use the up arrow key. And now you can actually control the timing. We give you three degrees either direction, it depends on how you program it at the beginning, to move the timing on that individual cylinder. We normally only recommend doing that if you have like an engine uh, guy there, an engine analyzer guy there can actually see what's happening inside the engine. Uh, when you do change the timing around, I mean, if you're running like 20 degrees timing on it and you move it three, three to degrees either direction, that might not have a real big change on it. But if you're running pre-chambers that are already only firing at three uh, degrees to begin with, three to four degrees to begin with, and then you add another three degrees to that, I mean, you could cause a lot of uh, damage to the engine. So, um, but we 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 allow you to do that. Um, uh, individual timing on, on the cylinders uh, if you need to. Uh, again, up to three degrees both directions. So, And you do it at one cylinder at a time. And then if you want to save that information, you, you go back in there and you hit the select mode. And this way you could save the offsets on it uh, by hitting the enter button. And that will save all the ones modifications you made. Now, if you wanted to, if you put all the information in there and the engine's not running proper and you want to go back to the beginning again, you can go into this offset equals zero and that will clear them all back to zero again. So, okay, this is from the setup button on the home screen. First thing you get is um, when you hit the setup, you multi-strike. So you could turn the multi-strike on either the 95 or the 2000 while the engine's running um, without any problems. It will um, just with a click of the up and down arrow key. Um, um, so if the engine's running lightly loaded and uh, it's misfiring a little bit, you can just go in there and turn that on to make the engine run um, smoother. Or like I said earlier, with the one step, you can actually have that done from an outside source, a uh, PLC, or uh, to do that. Um, again, on the uh, CPU 2000, it's going to fire the plugs four times when it's a multi-strike. 
and on the 95 it will fire the plugs two times so keep in mind though if you want to go to energy level three the multi-strike does not work at that you can only go to energy level one and two on both the 95 and the 2000 so it will go there but it won't actually uh, work so uh, this is the output voltage for the energy level one two and three so if you got a brand new set of plugs with a small gap on it uh, which rec I mean you, you want to start out with a low voltage on it so you don't uh, erode the plugs any faster than necessary and then we'll get into it a little later if you want to automatically jump to another energy level as the plugs start wearing out the, the system set up to do that so So you got that. So there'll be a second thing that will come up from the setup menu. So the first thing will be multi-strike, and then you'll get into the energy levels. Then you'll just use the up and down arrow keys to go for energy level one, two, and three. Remembering three only works with, in single strike. So from the home screen, okay, this is how what it would look like if you're firing them. Um, this is on oscilloscope. The bottom one is the capacitors being charged. The capacitor dumps. It recharges. It dumps again. But this is all happening on, on every strike. It does this. And then, of course, if you're running a 95, you'll just get two of these uh, coming in on it. So. so it's like an MST box if you're running a dragster or something. On the voltage on it here, keep in mind, as a plug wears out, the ionization voltage gets taller, and that's the reason we got to bump the energy level up to keep to get, to get that plug to arc. But after it actually starts arcing, it takes very low voltage to keep it arcing. But one thing to keep in mind is the taller this gets, the wider this gets, the raise time, the shorter the arc voltage gets. Um, so that's the reason we have the three different energy level on it, there, so we can push the plugs to the maximum wear on it. Because as, as the ionization gets taller, we can still push a lot of energy in it to get get the plug to arc, and then we can or get it to start arc, and then we can continue to arc it with a, with higher voltage on it. So so keep that in mind um, to utilize the different energy levels on that to get the maximum plug life out of it. Overspeed that's pretty easy. Like we talked about that earlier. Normally, again, we would recommend setting that higher than the PLC by maybe 10 RPM, 20 RPM, and let the PLC or the panel uh, shut the engine down uh, and have this for a backup if it didn't work. So, The reset pin. The reset pin is basically designed to calibrate the display on the logic module. Um, it doesn't actually move the reset pin. It's just um, it moves the, it doesn't move the timing any. It just moves the display at the bottom. In this case, it's it's uh, 10 degrees or 10.5 degrees before top dead center. And let's just say you're on the engine with a timing light, and it says um, 15 degrees before top dead center. Well, the timing light's accurate. I mean, that's because it's coming off a spark plug. So that's what you want this to read. So you would go into here on the reset pin, and you would adjust the up and down arrow key until you got the bottom here to read 15 degrees before top dead center. And it's a way to calibrate uh, the display for that. So uh, it doesn't, again, it does not move the timing. It strictly just moves the display information to read correctly. Value protection. Uh, in this case, um, we on a on 2000, we do not give you a password to put into it. We basically, you have a choice of turning it off and on. So if it's off, nobody can get in there and change any information on it, um, change the timing or change anything on it. Um, but again, it's not password protected. Now, the 95, uh, the, with a newer version we have, with the newer display, you can actually get in there and put a four-digit um, password in it. Um, and also, I believe with the XL, I think you can do it also with that. So, uh, But with the 2000, the only protection it has from getting people in there to push, stop them from pushing button is to turn the value protection on. So, and that's in the setup switch. View uh, the ignition setup. This is where you would go in and look at how the engine's programmed. So, 
Uh, in this case, the F stands for how many cylinders. It's a six-cylinder engine. The two stands for two cycle. The A stands for even fire. And then it's got um, 360 holes or gear teeth on the flywheel. Uh, the H stands for that it's a uh, CPU 2000. And then the S, you don't see the S too often because it's a special um, timing code in it. And we'll see that on the next slide here. So, And then the 100 is used as a reference number for the S. And then this here is showing you that the, uh, the setup is only using one, and that's for the uh, one-step switch on it. So, And this is what it would look like. So you can see up here on top what the code looks like. So this explains it all below that. The F being how many cylinders, the two being a two-cycle. Again, with a two-cycle, if you're going to separate the coils with two different primaries, you'll need to put a six in there. And of course, an eight for the four cycles. So, so keep that in mind. Uh, the A stands for an even fire pattern, and you'll get this information from our installation sheet. Um, how many holes or gear teeth are on it? The H stands for the 2000. And again, down here with the S, it's a, a special range that's it's been it's called factory programming, but um, it's information that has to be stored somewhere because. We don't know what that is unless we wrote it down somewhere. So, so keep that in mind. Normally, you'll find either an A, B, or C in the program. Um, once in a great while, we have done some customers that required a special setup on it that we did. But, uh, but again, that has to be documented somewhere um, in case it, need, it needs to be reprogrammed in the future. So, um, again, they gave it a 12 here as a reference. Whoops. Uh, as a reference um, to go back to to look it up. So now all the stuff we talked about earlier, as far as turning the one-step switch on, uh, turning a multi-strike on, turning a high energy on, it's all these numbers down here. Um, oops, bad fingers. So, anyways, if you wanted to use multi or uh, these different uh, codes in here, uh, in this case, the one-step, as you could see up. Well, this is a five here. So if you do the five, they've used the one and they've used the four. So they're using the one step and they're using the extended firing when the engine when the engine is less than uh, 200 RPM. That's where the four comes up by adding those two together. Um, again, a lot of things that could be used would be uh, if you wanted to, um, like we talked about earlier, if you wanted to turn multi-strike on using an outside source, um, you would use, um, okay, that would be number four. Um, I got the 64 down here, so I got I got mixed up here. So, so if you wanted to say turn um, um, a multi-strike on, then you would want to program this as four. Then you could, then by grounding that input lead, that uh, one-step lead to uh, ground, that would turn that on um, anytime you wanted to under a light load or uh, heavy load or whatever. So um, normally, if we were going to set these things up, we normally would use the maximum energy level at 200 RPM, and that would be 32. And then we would use the uh, uh, extended firing, that would be um, the multi-strike, and that would be on two. So to start these up, we would turn the multi-strike on and turn the energy level on, even though in this case, it would only go to energy level two because we've got the multi-strike on. Um, to get the engine started, and as soon as it ramped over 200 RPM, it would go back to its normal firing pattern, so on it. So, um, so that's how you set it up. And now one of the things you're probably asking is, yeah, that would be nice to do, but my computer doesn't have the serial port to hook up to it, so I can't program these anymore. Well, thanks to our engineering group, we have fixed that problem. Uh, these are still, I think, in the field being field tested, but they will be available, if they're not right now, um, to everybody uh, real soon. Um, it's an adapter we made up that works off a USB port, and we do have some people on the phone here that has used it, and uh, they are working great. So um, go talk to your either distributors or get a hold of us, and we'll figure out how to get you one. So I'm not sure on the pricing on it, um, but I heard it was going to be reasonable. So. We're going to be issuing, issuing uh, that bulletin that you can see. You're connected to your computer. You can see that service bulletin 523. 
Uh, the engineering guys are, are finalizing that, but that will come out with a, uh, a short introductory letter uh, along with a, you know, the, the part number indicated in a user price. So I would give us a week or two on that and everybody should get that email from Chuck Cooper uh, outlining that so that uh, if you wish to wish to acquire one, you can you can do so. Will, will that work just for CPU 2000 or will that work also for CPU 95s? 95 also, I'm, I'm under, uh, my understanding, yes. But the 95, oh. if you got the newer display, you can use the a printer cable right to the back of the display, so. Just to just to talk about that a little bit, um, John. So the adapter. So what what Mike is saying is yes, it'll work with the 95 if you're using just regular communication. Now the the 95 with the nine bit to the um, host adapter, that will need a new terminal program, and that has not been written yet. So if you want to talk to the 95, you're going to use the new display, and not this for now. Um, the, the one thing about the hardware, though, is it can be used in place of the standard BNB modem. Um, the only thing is this one's not isolated, so it's really targeted at the 2000 right now. Um, but if you had this in your bag and you wanted to talk to um, a CD200 or EPC50 or whatever, and you didn't have a BNB modem, um, you would just hook up, you know, your red and black wire, A and B, whatever you have. And it would act just as if um, you pulled the terminal program up and used the uh, the traditional BNB that we offer. Um, but the 95 uh, with the 9-bit CERNU, uh, this does not work with that. You'll still need either the ho you know the native port on your PC or the advanced display. Okay, thank you, guys. So good news from us for that. So because I know that's been something that's been asked for quite some time. So. Um, Hopefully that will make the 2000s a lot easier to program. So, uh, current loop. Um, if you got into um, the next button from the setup button, um, this will tell you the beginning of the current loop and the end of the current loop as far as the 4 to 20. In this case, um, it's from 0 to 24 degrees retard on it. Um, but again, back to that special mode. Um, if you had one specially made up, there may be some internal stuff going on in there that the only way to figure that out would be you'd have to actually um, power the uh, logic module up and run it through the full 20, uh, 4 to 20 milliamp and actually read what's going out on it. But, uh, but most of them are pretty a straight line on it. They don't get into some custom stuff. So um, but this will you'll be able to see this from your display if it's a normal one. You just don't know what's happening in the middle. So. Um, and this will give you the RPM on it also for the ramping on it if you were using it. Uh, it's telling you from 0 to 200, I'm going to move the timing, retard the timing uh, 10 degrees. Um, and then at 200 RPM, it goes back to 0 degrees retard. So. And then it road stakes back to the beginning again uh, of the setup on it. So. And this just sort of gives you an example of from the home screen, you hit the setup button, and this is what what you would page through and find underneath the setup button. And then back to the beginning again. Uh, with version 2.1, um, these are the different communications that you have capable uh, uh, capability of having. Um, Normally, if you're doing any programming, it's got to be up here on top. And I don't think, Matt, that has changed any, right? That's whether you want a new adapter, this is still where it's got to be, correct? That's correct. Okay. Yep. Uh, be the only, th just to touch on that a little bit, the only thing that'll be different, and for anyone who has a um, prototype adapter out there, there'll be one final release um, of an updated version, I believe. Version 5 was the prototype version sent to anyone who has um, a, a field test unit, and version 6 should be the final version. So um, if you're going to use the native port, like you have a PC already that's talking um, over the CERNU, you're going to use the you know, version 4, or 
original terminal program. And then if you're gonna use the new adapter with a USB and a Windows 10 or whatever machine, then you're gonna use the latest version and this will all be lined out in the service bulletin, but everything will be um, the same. All you have to do is just make sure you're using the correct version terminal program, um, hook it up and it'll just talk. So that's the only, all the magic is in the, uh, the latest version of the terminal program. So if you're trying to use version four and the adapter, it, it will not work. So the, the magic sauce is in all of the programming that we've built into um, how we talk to the unit out of a PC um, and, na and naturally the hardware, but uh, most of the, most of the engineering went into the terminal program. So just as a FYI that you'll need to use that latest version, everything else will stay exactly the same. Okay, great. Again, this is what, um, if you're going to program it, that's what we recommend. So. Okay, this is why uh, also. Hey, Mike, uh, just one thing I want to touch on, I guess, as we're diving a little deeper into some of these things. As a, as a lot of people have been around for a while, um, this is just probably secondhand knowledge, but for anyone who may not know this, what we're talking about with 9-bit is Modbus is traditionally 8-bit communication, and that's just the protocol, how it, you know, the information it sends back and forth is 8 bits. The, uh, the CPU 2000 and the 95 originally started out with a 9-bit, which is a polarity bit, so it's a, kind of an abstract from the original Modbus standard. So when we talk about 9-bit, that's what we're talking about. So um, just for what it's worth and, and when you're looking at these things and if you're looking at various products, um, you know, an 8-bit bus is traditional. And uh, these products, you know, several years ago were designed with 9-bit. And that's what we're overcoming with uh, the adapter and the additional programming. So on the screen before, it just says 9-bit. And if you're just kind of glancing through, it may not mean a whole lot, but... Um, if you're trying to hook these to different things or or talk to other devices, it means a whole heck of a lot. So um, just be aware that 9-bit was like an abstract of the traditional 8-bit Modbus standard. So um, it, it just matters when you're talking to PLCs and different things that that, that number 9 has quite significance um, when you're talking serial communication over Modbus. So. Okay, good, guys. Uh, okay, from the setup also, uh, you'll get to this diagnostic module uh, or a page here, and that's well, this is where you would turn off. If you're not using a diagnostic module, um, this is where you would turn that part of the program off, or if you have one in for repair and you don't want the alarm to come up that, that it's missing, uh, you can turn it off and on here. So, um, again, if you're going to reinstall the diagnostic module, I recommend you re hit the reset button. Um, to regenerate all the settings and stuff in it. So, um, um, the, uh, the diagnostic count reference numbers here or frequency numbers, um, or there's a high and low on that. And the different determines how many coils you are running to get the good numbers um, um, on your display. And this gives you a little bit of an example how to do that um, or how to set it up. So if you're running one coil, you want to set that frequency to low. And if you're running two coils, you want to set it up on high. If you have it wrong, you'll see either a real high reading uh, numbers up in the maybe the 190s to 2, um, 220 range or somewhere in that area. Um, or the other way around, they'll be really low numbers. So... Um, so if you're seeing that, you can go in there and change that frequency number from the display or uh, from the setup button, and that will get your reference numbers more in a range that are more useful uh, on that. So uh, the mid max, this is where it collects the information for the reference numbers. Uh, and normally, when you start the engine up, it's very unstable, jumps around a lot. So, so this will allows you to put in a um, an RPM. Um, reference number, a RPM um, number in there to say don't collect anything below, in this case, 250 RPM. So, so normally you want to set this up just a little bit below where the engine idles at. So when it gets up and gets up and running online, there it's not collecting junk information. Um, um, 
it's you know collect good data um, so that's what that's um, is set up for okay the bar graph if you run in a 2.1 or uh, version of this we've added a little bar graph to the screen that's with the DSM uh, button comes in at you push it first and then you can see uh, these are all your reference numbers all lined up in a row here so and as you can see E and M here possibly could have an issue so instead of him going through all individual ones from the F1 button you can just go here and say okay I, I need to go to E and look at that or I maybe need to go to M and look at that and look for a problem so it's made it a lot nicer and you can look at everything all at the same time so uh, then the next one is the uh, high and low from a engine average so the the dash mark would be the engine average uh, and then you can see where the bar graphs goes up and down from that so it gives you another quick quick look um, to look for problems on it and then we have the coefficient number uh, that's telling you how stable the spark is uh, and I use that a lot for diagnostic purposes um, and you can see here there's possibly a problem with E or M here um, so that gives you an idea you need to go look at that particular cylinder and look for any kind of sparking that may be going on uh, from a wire to the cylinder head or uh, you know maybe you may get some visual stuff going on there but it's definitely something uh, the next time the engine may be shut down for uh, maintenance or something that these are two cylinders you would definitely want to look at so now this is what we're going to go into in, in um, how to set up the displays uh, and they're done with the F uh, buttons So F, uh, from the home screen, you hit the F1 button. Uh, and the first thing that will come up is, uh, in this case, it's cylinder one. Um, and it's telling you the coefficient here is nine. And I would consider that high. Normally, if I'm setting these systems up, I'll set that to alarm at 10. Um, so I'm, I'm, normally, they run between one and three, possibly, if, they, if it's firing well. So so this case here, this is this spark, this coefficient number is telling me that spark is jumping around enough to raise that uh, reference number to, to nine. And then the cylinder average is 132. Well, if you look at the engine average, it's 125. So that's also telling you that there's a problem where I'm, I'm, I'm the reference number is I'm consuming more energy on this particular cylinder also. So the idea on the spark not being stable on the coefficient and also the the cylinder average is high higher than engine average there's there's a potential problem with the uh, spark plug or coil or a secondary wiring or something on this engine causing that to do that so now in this case here this we're looking at uh, a, a 32 output and being we've got the primary wire separated on it um, you'll see that if this is on one cylinder, you'll see uh, the top one we just looked at has a problem. But if you look at the bottom one down there, um, you'll notice that the, uh, the average on that one is only 115. So that's telling me that this is probably set up to where it has a pre-chamber on one spark plug and an open chamber on the other. And with the version 2.1, we actually separated the alarms on those for that purpose. Um, so we can have two different banks or uh, with oh, both cables will have their own alarm information on it so in this case here uh, the a2 is looks like it's doing fine the coefficient number is low um, uh, the cylinder average is, is really close to what the engine average is so uh, that probably not a problem on that one but the spark plug next to it the spark plug next to it um, is definitely has an issue you want to look at that so Now this is the instantaneous, this is that information we're collecting after, in this case it was 250 RPM if we left it that way. So uh, this is good information to use if you reset it every time you put a spark, a new set of spark plugs in it. Because this mid-max will sit there and generate information forever until it's reset again. So in this case, the lowest it's ever been is 120. The highest it's been is 142. And then right now the instantaneous is 132. But to look at this, if you don't know the last time it's been reset, um, 
you don't know it could be years ago that this information would have was been generated it's just they never been cleared so normally we recommend if we get in there is when you get to the screen you hit the reset button on it and it will clear the mid max um, so if you put a new set of plugs in there you want to come here and clear that um, and then let it generate new information so next time you look at this saying well last time I put a set of plugs in here this is what the condition was what's what's happened what's been generated on that so and then also the scaling in here um, you can see the low this would be the low alarm and this would be the high alarm and this is information that you put in there and we'll get to that here shortly uh, so we're in the middle of that so it didn't alarm on anything because our alarm set points are far enough out that it didn't trigger the high or low on that so now the F3 button this is where you would go and and, and calibrate the coils um, if you have coils that were built 30 40 years ago and you start putting new coils on although we would recommend you replace all the coils um, there's a good chance the reference numbers will not be the same so in this particular portion here um, we allow you to go in there and set offsets to the coils uh, the reference numbers to get them um, closer to the engine average in this case here we're looking at 132 and if you know the spark plugs are good the wiring's good the the towers and the coils are being cleaned so you know the the ignition itself is, is the best it can be and you're still reading these high numbers in there there's a possibility the coil may be old um, and you need to calibrate it to get it to where the other coils are so we uh, uh, this is where we would do that at so again don't look at it to fix a, a problem um, look at it to calibrate a coil that you know it's, it's probably in good condition so okay the F2 button is where we're going to set the thresholds up so from the home screen you hit the F2 uh, the first one comes up as low spark voltage in this case it's set at 50 um, if you're running around 90 let's just say uh, let's just say 100 for a good good round number that sense the possibility of setting this at 50 you may not ever get to 50 so you want to make sure when you set these numbers up there 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 are places where they're going to help you so if that coil or if that spark plug shorts out for whatever reason it gets oil fouled or uh, for some reason quits sparking you want to make sure wherever you're at in a normal condition that it's going to go down far enough to where it will trigger this another thing you'll run into if you got the coils hooked up so you're running one primary wire your two coils like we talked about at the beginning one plug may fall out but the other plug still firing so you may not be able to get the numbers low enough where it will trigger that low voltage on it so um, so keep that in mind try to tighten these numbers up if you want to really utilize this um, this information don't put them way out um, where they where you're never going to be able to trigger them so high spark voltage normally we would recommend setting that up if, especially if you have an engine analyzer guy there or, or if you know when you normally don't do a plug change after so many hours figure out where the reference number is at that time and then set this up uh, really close to where that where it actually is firing at when the plugs are old so when you get to this same condition again when the plugs are wore out in the same condition you can trigger this high spark alarm and it will tell you okay the plugs are in the same condition they were the last time I changed them and you can use it as a, uh, a reference to uh, when the plugs need to be changed again none of this stuff is going to shut the engine down it's just going to give you an alarm to let you know the plugs have worn out or something in the secondary side has um, caused a higher voltage demand that gave you some higher numbers also what we've done with that with the 2.1 we have separated um, uh, the two cables on it the, the two output cables um, for the idea that if you run in pre chambers or open chambers you may need two different threshold settings uh, to alarm on so and again on the version 2.1 with a 32 output you'll have to set this low spark voltage up twice one for cable one and one for cable two and the same also for the high spark voltage again they'll probably if it's if it's a pre-chamber and open chamber they'll probably wear out at different times so using the same alarm limit you know probably won't work so 
Now, the no secondary, we have left that alone. That stays one uh, for both sides. And basically, that's telling you that the spark plug wire has fallen off the, or fallen off the coil. Uh, again, that's something you may want to try to because it may not get to 250. It, um, it may be up to maybe 180 or something like that. So to utilize these numbers correctly, you've got to either put the engine in that condition where it will actually trigger that or keep them somewhat close enough where it actually fires at and then put limits um, just uh, slightly above that. So low from engine average, uh, and this comes from the factory at 60. Normally I'll tighten those up to like maybe around 20. Um, that's just telling you that uh, wherever the engine average is at, this particular cylinder got below 60 in this case and it alarmed that cylinder. So again, with the newer version of 2.1, we have separated that also with the lows and highs. Uh, so you can each cable have their own setting. And again here, uh, the high from engine average, just the opposite. For some reason, that particular cylinder got, in this case, above 60. Normally, I, I would use a lower number there also. And then, um, and then the high variation. The factory settings on that is 40. Again, I usually set that with a 2,000, around 10. Um, if, it's, if it triggers at 40, I mean, it's pretty obvious what it is. So normally, I like to check it a little, catch it a little earlier than that. And normally, 10, 15 is normally a good setting on that. You'll probably find a problem. Uh, with that setting earlier. Okay, like we talked about earlier, we are able with this system um, to take the energy levels and increase them automatically uh, as the plugs wear out because we're looking at these reference numbers. So, so say we're running, again, these are some high numbers that comes from the factory. So we run running at around 100 and we get to like maybe 110. Uh, plugs are starting to road a little bit, so we can set this uh, system up so when it gets to 110, it automatically bumps it to energy level 2. Then if it gets below uh, maybe 105, it will bump the energy level back to, um, to energy level 1. And the same thing on 3, maybe if it gets to uh, 120, we'll bump the energy level up to energy level 3. And if it gets below maybe 115, we'll bump it back to energy level 2. So we can do all this automatically. And, it, and if it's set up right, it does work well. Um, we've had some, uh, where we've collected the information on a, on a PLC, it looks like a sawtooth effect on it. Um, where the reference numbers go up, you can see a plug change happen. The reference numbers come back down um, until the plugs wear back out again. So it just it's an up and down deal. So instead of going in there yourself and bumping up the energy levels to try to keep the engine running, well, the system is set up to do that automatically. And then after, of course, a new set of plugs, it automatically runs back to energy level one again. Again, we can't really give you a number to put in there because every engine is different. Um, Turbocharged engines, natural aspirated engines, they all run at different reference numbers. So it's something you've got to pretty much set up on the engine uh, while it's running. So. Again, we went through this earlier. I just wanted to, you know, um, talk about it here a little bit um, about uh, testing the coils. These are our shielded coils. We got a voltmeter on the positive primary side and the uh, secondary side. It should read around uh, between 7,000 and 10,000 ohms on that. Primary side is where this stuff comes into. Uh, between um, 1.9 and 2.7. Now testing the primary harnesses. Uh, again, if you have time to shut the engine down or if it's during the maintenance season, highly recommend taking a voltmeter or an ohmmeter and going through and checking all these pins, the engine ground, and then you'll end up with some type of uh, output number here. And you can see that there's hardly any difference in there, but this is what they have found on these three cylinders that there was loose connections on them. And after making the correction, they were able to uh, clean that up a little bit, so. And we talked about that already. And we've talked about the DET stuff, so I'm just gonna buzz through that because I'm consuming time. Um, again, if you're gonna use a detonation device with a 2000, you'll need this little adapter here. 
to be able to talk to the fire A and fire B because uh, it's all low voltage stuff. Uh, it's different than the 95 where we actually look at the coil uh, voltage on it. And this is the window timing on it there. Instead of looking at all the vibration, we were just looking at where we set up the, uh, the DET to look at only the vibration in little areas like this. So, And this is actually a Clark engine that we actually was in detonation. And you can see in eight steps it brought it out of detonation. Um, so it gives you an idea what it does. And that's it for me. Sorry I took more time than needed. But um, any questions before we go on to the VSM? All right. Uh, just one question. Uh, just uh, only the installation. It is uh, just uh, skipped up. I kept for the last. Okay. The positive grounding and the negative grounding. How it is affecting? Because 24 volt negative is the grounding common to the body engine. So the coil we grounding to positive ground. So how it is going to affect and how it is doing? What is the difference with CPU 95 and CPU 2000? You want to answer that, Matt? Sorry, can you can you just repeat the exact first part one more time? I, I heard the between positive and negative and the CPU and the 2000, but what was the first part? Yeah, just to, my question, the 24 volt DC, the, the power we are grounding to the engine body, the coil positive side is grounding to engine body. So is it make any trouble or something? Why is this a difference in this grounding, the negative grounding and positive grounding? Okay, so depending on how the whole system is wired um, and the polarity of the coil, in general, everything will be exactly the same for operation. Um, the only difference that you'll see um, if you're using, say, a blue coil, and if you if you wire the blue coil still um, correctly, such that if it's a positive ground, um, that you would wire the ground to the um, positive side of the coil, such that the primary used to attach to, and then you wire the primary to the negative side, you won't see anything that's different. Now, if you wire the coil backwards, um, such that you have positive ground, so all the grounds connect to negative, and you connect the um, primary side to the positive, then what you'll see is a difference in polarity, right? So um, the only thing there will be that you'll fire the coil backwards because you're firing the primary um, backwards. There's generally a two to three kV difference so if you're firing a positive ground system on coils and you didn't rewire the coil, you'll probably see about a 2 to 3 kV um, increase in demand. Other than that, um, you shouldn't see anything because uh, as long as the conventions are correct and you're not obviously shorting anything or doing anything um, mismatched, then the system will just operate and the, um, the spark plug would just show um, just that difference, but everything else should be um, exactly the same because it's just 24 volts relative to the common that we need. Um, and then as long as all the grounding is in place and everything's operational, uh, you shouldn't see any any operationally difference other than that um, increase in demand across the spark plug. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's fine. You just Okay, Matt. Okay, are you ready to move over to the 95 EVS? I believe so, yes. Yeah, let's go All ahead. Right. And I will make it quick because I know, um, obviously, if there's any questions or things, please just stop me um, in the middle and just ask questions as we go along. Um, and we've got about 20 minutes, so... Uh, I'll try to move along fairly quickly. Um, so what what really brought this about was we had a, a uh, kind of a release note with everyone. Um, most people probably were on that call, and we we announced that the 95 EVS now works with the 
um, cat EIS system under the valve cover uh, coil and that was with the 35 series 3500 series engines um, there was a lot of questions surrounding installation not necessarily technically how it worked um, we had several out there so what we're going to go through right now is more of the installation and guidelines some wiring there was a question last um, session about the difference between the DET 1600 and the 1620, so we'll cover that. Um, and again, if you have any questions, please feel free to stop me. Um, but we have had several field installations. The first one we're gonna go through is uh, mainly with, uh, came from Bill Moore um, out west, and um, also there's another installation from Curtis. They've been uh, generous enough to provide us some installation pictures and uh, you know, we, we'll go through some of those here. So um, with that, we'll kind of get started with um, some of the basic wiring. So for anyone who's not familiar with um, the 95 EVS as it stands, um, here's a basic layout. Um, the major thing that's different uh, in general is just this power supply. So that's gonna be panel mounted. Um, so we're gonna wanna keep that you know, uh, away from any harsh environments. Uh, put it in pro some sort of protected enclosure. And um, the 95 EVS, depending on what you're running um, in terms of energy and the, uh, the cylinder count, um, we have a max of about 400 watts, which is um, generally, say, triple or quadruple what we're used to, um, you know, for our traditional 95s and um, uh, basic systems. So, there's, there's quite a bit of power, so it's got a fan in it. Um, and to, to be able to operate all this, we're, we're gonna have to keep that um, somewhat nice and cool so it's not uh, you know IP65 rated or 67 rated like you're typically used to. And we'll see um, where that was mounted here in just a little bit. So on the cat coil installation, what's different, and we went over this last time, is that there's, the installation of this easy rail junction box um, and just to recap on that and uh, thanks to um, you know Kenneth and and the guys that were really looking into this provided us some great feedback so um, we've updated the uh, some of the instructions and gone through and and updated some of the stuff in the manual um, but the the big thing about this is um, one question came up about how to get over to this adapter and we'll cover some adapter wiring here in a minute but um, we added in the typical 101 junction box um, the addition of uh, the the primary wire out so it used to just be the G lead um, but now we put a in there um, which happened you know like a year ago and what that does is you, you use a typical three pin MS connector that now comes out and we have both the G lead and the a wire um, in here and then this uh, easy rail junction box takes in um, a 19 pin connector, comes out a nine pin, 19 pin connector and goes out to this 37 pin connector. And as we talked about in the past, this, this letter E harness right here is uh, very, very special such that it goes into the engine block connector. So you don't have to do any special wiring or anything under the valve covers. We just plug right into the engine, but each model is engine specific. Um, 8, 12, and 16, and they're all decoded a special way, and they all have a, um, each coil in, in the engine has a series diode in it. So we've taken care of the polarity and the mapping in this uh, E harness right here. So um, we've heard of people trying to maybe build them themselves and uh, some other stuff. So the best thing to do is just to get it from us and it'll be handled for you. And the main reason for the junction box outside of just getting to the DET is to be able to check timing um, and to just get at the primary wires in general, which um, everyone should be familiar with. Um, but it is a fully connectorized plug and place system. Um, and then we'll see here in just a little bit how each of these pieces kind of play in um, to the system through the, the pictures that we'll provide from the actual installation. So. Um, again, this is just kind of covering some of the questions and concerns that we had um, when we first announced this. So you can see uh, right here, we had the old EIS system. And again, 
if you're dealing with an atom based system those generally have a, uh, a newer proprietary cat based harness um, that we we are not um, at the moment able to buy so we can only update to the EIS based systems and that's where they used a 37 pin um, military MS spec connector and that is available on the market so we've been able to kind of um, capitalize on that and create a system but for the atom based ones generally that's been a cat proprietary connector that um, was molded uh, I believe it's plastic actually just for them so here you can see um, on the uh, the old EIS on the left the 95 EVS on the right and then generally what we've seen um, from all the installations is they mount the easy rail junction box directly above the ignition um, a nice sh short run um, 19 to 19 here you can see the three pin that comes out um, that runs over to the panel and then the uh, the 19 that comes out of here and then it actually runs over to here and we'll show you a little bit more um, on this 37 pin and we offer various lengths and different things to be able to uh, accommodate the run and the length of this but this is the typical setup we've seen where uh, these two boxes are located um, fairly close to each other so what you have here um, again this is the power supply that generates the um, the high voltage so it's minus 185 uh, 400 watts worth of power and you can see they have this panel mounted which is nice um, and it's kind of vibration uh, dampened obviously it's a panel anyway but um, it's mounted right here the fan you can see it has nice airflow in and then it actually blows the air out on the other side um, and then these are the input connectors here uh, but again wanting to panel mount that or create a nice um, environmental enclosure as much as possible for that but if you're going to put it in some sort of other remote mounted box from environmental protection you know you're going to want to um, allow enough for air circulation and airflow um, to be able to, to get around the box so we don't overheat anything um, so one thing we wanted to cover here um, you can see that this is a DET based installation um, so they took and actually used what was existing on the uh, the water jacket here for um, the old cat style mounting and uh, I'll, I'll cover another slide here uh, just a few slides down um, but if we move on to this the actual better location that uh, that our guys and, and you guys have been able to to come up with um, and Bill please feel free to jump in here if uh, if you want to add anything because I know these are coming you know straight out of your application um, but they found it better to actually put it on the head um, they actually got better uh, you know amplification and uh, ability to sense um, the detonation sensing from the relocating these onto the head so um, anyway they used to be down here on these plates and where the water jacket was um, and they they found much better performance by moving them up so the other thing that came out of this um, from actually talking to Bill was that um, in, in the later versions of the DET software um, there's an enable by tens so what this does is it increases the gain coming from those um, Bosch piezoelectric sensors by a factor of 10 and um, accor again according to what we've heard from the field is that uh, they were not able to get reliable output or performance um, looking at the detonation sensors without enabling this times 10 generally on these cat 3500 series engines um, that may spread to other engines but for sure um, they, they did not get reliable output and sensing um, until they enabled this uh, tens factor on the 3500 series so just be aware that that's there that if you're not getting um, you know the the amplitude that you need so again these are 26 millivolt output sensors and the way they work is um, you shake them and they generate their own millivolt output at an amplitude and frequency of um, you know how hard you're shaking them and how fast you're shaking them um, so if uh, if they're damped in any way from the mass or um, from how they're mounted or anything to do with the engine application um, 
you can enable this and it'll give you a nice uh, boost in your signal. Can you go back okay. one slide, Matt? Sure. One more. So that new location that's that's on the head proper as opposed to the uh, the the uh, the cam cover, correct? That's correct. Yep. So that cam so cover they... doesn't really have any torque on it. So there's not going to be a lot of maybe not a maybe not a, a good seat to what's happening inside the engine, the cylinder. Yeah. So that's that's a good point. If you're just looking at that, that these are vertically mounted and probably have a gasket. You know, some sort of maybe not not necessarily the same type of gasket as the heads. So you're right. Maybe the the vibration coming out this way is being damped through that mechanical, um, you know, application. Yeah, the softness here. of the the softness of the gasket and the low torque of the bolt. Bolt. Yep. So when those are put on, that looks like it's it's not part of the head the head bolt system. It's it's a it's just a. Uh, a threaded a threaded hole that's available already yes those those holes are already threaded on the the head flange there alex and just to be clear on we tried the sensor on both locations and this picture here shows where we had the best amplitude uh for setting it and did you now, have to dress that, that to surface the those are all tap, yes. We didn't have to drill and tap any of those. So they're existing. But it looks like there's an adapter being used on that on that sensor. It looks like there's uh, the head, the adapter, and then the sensor with the bolt. Right. We've done those for Waukesha's, like the 8 millimeter to 10 millimeter. And the, again, because the, the 8 millimeter thread hole in the sensor does not fit that threaded hole in the head flange. So we had to do an offset of the thread size. Did you have to dress that surface before the adapter was mounted or just right as it is? Well, the adapter helps with the surface area smoothness. So because the it's a casting on the head, it wasn't smooth. So as it was said last week, you have that facing tool, you would have had to use that facing right. tool if that thread was the, the right size, but it's not. So. Again, that's why the adapter was used. All right, thank you. Great stuff, thank you, Alex. Thanks, Bill. Um, okay, so let me, uh, we'll cover that later, okay. Um, so just this is just a picture of um, the EBS display. Again, if you're using this larger display, that's kind of characteristic of knowing you have the enhanced display for um, anyone who may have not seen it, but this is the best option um, if you're installing a new system to just talk uh, Modbus inherently. If you're using the, you know, the two-line display, um, that's where you'll have to talk with the uh, CERNU and native, dis um, native communications. And then uh, here's the DET installed, um, you know, just side-by-side -side in a panel. Uh, just your typical wiring, um, but the the thing here, and we'll cover this in a minute, um, is the addition here. You can see this panel mounted adapter. Um, so the adapter is going to work with the uh, DET1620, and we'll cover a little bit more about why that is the way it is. Um, and again, thanks to you know some of the feedback we got, all of these instructions have been updated with uh, additional instructions as well as um, you know, description in the manuals of, uh, you know, better describing how to use these parts and uh, what they do. Um, so you can you can see here um, where they mounted it, how the wiring is, and I'm just going to jump straight over to here. Um, so let's let's just take a second to talk about while we have the back of this um, DET 1620 here um, about what the difference is. So. Uh, realistically, there isn't a whole lot different between the 1600 and the 1620. Um, one of the things that I, I need to do is actually uh, probably update our literature just a little bit more, um, especially now uh, that everything's kind of web-based. It's a little easier to do that. Um, you know, just as of a couple of years ago, everything was still kind of paper printed, um, which which was a little tougher, but neither here nor there. And uh, what 
what's offered between the 1620 and the 1600 is it generally just says 1620 is used for CPU 2000s with positive ground systems, um, which says a lot for what it is if you're just going to hook it up. But if you want to use it in different applications, it's a little tough to understand. So what what is actually going on is the 1600 will use any um, A firing pattern and any G lead that are at your traditional 130 to 200 volt um, positive primary voltage. So you ground the DET, um, you ground your ignition, and the primary pulses that go to the plus of the coil are generally, um, depending on your energy level and the storage cap and the ignition, right, um, that we've been covering for the last four weeks, um, four sessions here, they uh, range from 130 to 200 volts. Um, so the DET 1600 accepts those inherently. Um, it has a, you know, a really um, high input impedance and looks at that at a very, very high voltage. Well, when you get to the negative ground systems, you can't just ground the DET 1600 and apply a negative voltage signal because everything we're doing for the DET 1600 um, is looking for a positive signal. So if you put a minus signal such as the 95 EVS or EVS for CAT um, or the CPU 2000, or any other positive ground ignition, the primary pulse is, is negative relative to ground. So it's minus 185 or minus 130 or minus 200, um, however that looks. So that minus is gonna destroy um, a DET 1600. So instead of just flipping the polarity on the DET 1620, the major difference is, and regardless of whether it's positive ground or negative ground, the, uh, the approach here is you'll see it on the first two terminals is you actually have a reset and fire input. So those are logic level plus five volt DC inputs. So we didn't actually just flip it around and say use negative voltage. We said just give us the fire and reset from our ignition and we'll just work. So that's what the, you know, the adapter on the 2000 does and that's what the adapter here does. And the major difference um, on the DET 1620 and really what is kind of vague in the literature is that we use uh, fire and reset um, five volt logic signals and then generally everything else is the same. Um, so that's really the major difference is that um, if you have an A cylinder that's firing, um, uh, you know, and you're, you know, you use a CD 200 or for whatever reason, um, you could get the fire and reset out. Um, essentially, you could plumb it into here and the DET 1620 would work. Um, so if you move over to the left here, that's what this adapter is doing and that's what the wiring is showing you um, is that we're taking in the G lead and where this comes into play, if you think back to the original pictures um, and what's important here is that um, the three pin connector that's coming out um, while drawing this electrically may be easy to represent. It's hard to visualize it in the system. So that's what some of those pictures up above and, and some more pictures that we'll get to are demonstrating is that the three pin connector comes out MS. Um, you're gonna tie it to the conduit in a panel like you saw earlier for the um, this panel mounted device. And then you're gonna plumb in um, the G lead and you're also gonna plumb in um, you know number one cylinder, I'm calling it A. And then on the output over here, um, out of 10 and 12, you're gonna get the fire and reset logic. So um, we've essentially stripped out all of the Verispark pulses. Um, and then we've created between the 24 volt um, synthetic G lead out of the EVS, um, as well as the minus uh, A firing or number one cylinder firing, we've created nice synthetic five volt pulses that come out over here that go to the DET 1620. Um, hopefully that's clear. If you have any questions, um, again, there's a ton of material now in the in the literature about how this works. This is actually from a service bulletin um, that's out on our website as well. And naturally, you can contact myself. Um, you know, there's Mike Porter, uh, Bill Moore, Curtis, who we'll get here in a second. Um, all have a lot of experience with installing these. So um, 
there is, like I said, there's a host of these out there already running. So if you have any questions, just feel free to get a hold of us. Um, this is just a little more in depth about how it was installed. So like I said earlier, this comes out on the left, wraps around and goes into this 37 pin connector. Um, you can see it down here. And uh, that's the old version disconnected. And then we plumb in and uh, it's all taken care of for you. Um, there was the addition of a, of a, uh, hold on, sorry about that, of a mag pickup um, over here. So we replaced the EIS stuff with our own. Um, and then we'll get down in here into the Hall Effect installation. And again, Bill, if you want to add anything, but um, this is where it is um, coming in on the cam gear. And then uh, they un undo this cover that we'll see. And then what Bill was talking about earlier, we have a nice little short magnet that they actually put in one of the gear, um, you know, spacings that they were sensing um, with the EIS system and then lined everything up. And then you can see this is our Hall effect there. Uh, this is just a larger picture for anyone who, for reference, who wants to know how to get in there. Original cam gear, um, I'm guessing they pulled this off drilled this right here for where number one top dead center was based on the keyway um, for their appropriate timing. And then um, there was one thing that happened and Curtis, uh, I'll, I'll kind of go through this a little bit if you want to add anything, but um, as far as I understand it, there was kind of a panel that got um, misplaced or something. So on the fly, uh, they were able to create an application where they put a DE3000, a 95 EVS, a DET1620, an Acticom, and an EPC, and they kind of rebuilt this, but um, you'll, you'll see some installation pictures of the EVS um, working. So here again, uh, the Easy Rail junction box is mounted pretty close to the Altronic ignition here, um, so you kind of see a pattern of how these things are mounted. Um, and then again, the uh, engine block connector, so our harness is running from the other side over to this EBC to hit the, uh, the cat coils. Um, the adapter uh, is used with the 1620 um, to be able to use, and this is where they have, again, close to the, the head here, um, they have the location of the DET sensors, um, the Acticom running uh, to do the uh, throttle control, and then the EPC for AFR, and that is the end of this. So uh, I know that was a lot and I tried to cover it pretty quick, um, but are there any questions on the EVS installation? I know there was quite a bit of um, feedback that came back from when we announced that. So if I didn't cover any of your questions or concerns, um, if you wanna bring them up now and I know it's late, you know, I can take them down and get back to the group. Um, but hopefully that answered everything about uh, how to install the 95 EVS with the EIS based system.